Greetings, students. So this video series will describe what are known as the spherical and hyperbolic geometries, commonly grouped together as non-Euclidean geometry. Now, it is vital to note that what students learn in the usual high school geometry class is based on the postulates of Euclid, who was a famous ancient Greek mathematician, as I'm sure you know. He wrote five basic axioms, and his geometry, which is considered standard today, was constructed from these. We have, for instance, as a result of these axioms, triangles whose angles always sum to 180 degrees. We have theorems on rhombi and other quadrilaterals. And all seems natural and well-ordered, perhaps. But I would like to bring you on a wondrous historical journey about beautiful alternative geometries, those amazing products of the human mind. Now, the 19th century was an extremely rich period of time. For developing new ideas for mathematics and science, etc. During this time, mathematicians, who by the way also worked as philosophers and scientists a lot of the time, were developing group theory, field theory, number theory, and many other excellent fields. I'm just going to write some notes here. So, group theory. Everest Galois. He's probably my second or third favorite mathematician. He was very influential in developing group theory and the field that is named after him, called Galois theory. Famous, short-lived French mathematician, Galois. Fields in mathematics are very uh, useful structures. And then we also have number theory. So my personal favorite mathematician, whose name is Carl Friedrich Gauss, he's my first favorite, um, lived in this time, in the 19th century, uh, in Germany, as a mathematician. He taught in the very important University of Göttingen, and one of his students, Bernhard Riemann, would continue much of Gauss's work even after his teacher's death. Gauss and many others by this time had been suspicious about Euclid's fifth postulate, known in her class as the parallel postulate. Now, as, as you know, this states that if you have one line in, in a certain space, call it line L, and a point not on the line, some point, then there exists one and only one line through the point that is going to be parallel to the given line. So one and only one parallel line exists. Now, these mathematicians suspected that this wasn't always true. They suspected that it could be broken in some fundamental way. And it, it turns out, Gauss set about to demonstrate in the real world why the parallel postulate wasn't entirely true. Ultimately, Gauss was unsuccessful, but his theories and ideas lived on. So, Riemann continued his ideas, and soon came to spherical and hyperbolic geometries. Now, a very, very common diagram you'll see as an example of spherical geometry is, of course, we have we have the sphere in three space. So we have the sphere, S2,
and let's say we were actually to draw a kind of triangle on this sphere. You know what? I think I'll put these three points that form the triangle, two on the equator, and one at the pole, okay? So we have a line coming down, connecting these points. And we do that for each pair of points. Forming, of course, a triangle. And, of course, we say this is perpendicular, it forms a 90 degree angle, and that's legitimate. This, this line comes down from the pole, and it's on the equator, so that forms 90 degrees. And this point, or this, this angle, so to speak, also forms a, a right angle in a similar fashion. And let us suppose that in this scenario, this triangle also is technically a right angle. This angle is actually also right at, at the pole. So now in this case, we have a perfectly legitimate triangle. And yet you'll note that the sum of each angle is not 180 degrees, but rather 270 degrees, because there are three 90 degree angles. So I would like to clarify now that this spherical geometry is actually a subset of a much neater generalized subject called elliptic geometry. And in, in spherical geometry, which is the most common 3D model of elliptic geometry. We have these so-named uh, great circles on the surface of the sphere. And you can imagine the longitude and lat latitude lines that exist on the Earth. And of course they are imaginary lines. like the equator, for example. And these are the, the so-called lines in this geometry. Those are defined as being the lines in this geometry, these, these great circles. And in addition, in a very interesting way, we mathematicians define antipodal points, points that are on kind of opposite sides, a, a exact opposite sides, on the sphere. Such that the line, if we were to take a line through these two points, then the line itself would be basically a diameter, or, you know, the, the longest such segment that you can create through the sphere. We're basically saying that these two antipodal points are actually identical, meaning they are considered equal in this geometry. So with these axioms that we've created, we actually have what is called the real projective plane. So we have the, the factors that make this the real projective plane, and, and we'll, we'll get to describing this projective plane later. But I'm just going to write this. The great circles are the lines on the surface of this, this globe or sphere that we have. And in addition, we know that antipodal points are 
We're saying they're equal. They're considered the same. And so I've made many videos in the past on the projective plane. And in particular, I uh, my my favorite kind of geometry itself is actually the complex projective plane using complex numbers, which you'll learn about next year. Anyway, now on to hyperbolic geometry. Now, this geometry is in some sense unique, and probably unlike anything you've ever seen before. In hyperbolic geometry, there are actually an infinite number of lines passing through the point that are not intersecting the given line. So in terms of Euclid's fifth postulate, there are actually not one and only one line passing through P that is parallel to the given line. I know that doesn't really look parallel, but just bear with me for now. In Euclidean geometry, you know there's one and only one line parallel to the given line. That's Euclid's fifth postulate, essentially. But in hyperbolic geometry, there are an infinite number of lines passing through this point here that are not intersecting this given line. Infinity, right? Not just one, but infinity. That's what makes this so interesting. So, in 1868, the Italian mathematician Eugenio Beltrami developed the hyperbolic plane with two profound mathematical papers. At first, he used what is called a theoretical pseudosphere which, for those of you interested, has a, has a specific definition as follows. While the sphere has a curvature equal to 1 over r squared, the pseudosphere has the same curvature, but it is made negative now. So it's it's kind of like the, the opposite curvature, which is very interesting. So then, this mathematician amazingly proved that the hyperbolic geometry is logically consistent with itself, if and only if Euclidean geometry is consistent. So Euclidean geometry and hyperbolic geometry are therefore linked in this interesting way. Now, a common example, or a common model of hyperbolic geometry is known as the Beltrami-Klein model, or the Klein-Disk model. And sometimes it's given a kind of diagram where we have a circle. All right, that's that's close enough to a circle. And in this circle is enclosed points and lines basically. Except the lines we define as structures that look like this. So that's very interesting. Instead of being straight lines, they are, from our perspective, more curved lines, right? So if we have a line through this point, then the way I understand it, we can have an infinite number of lines as we define them, which are really curved lines that are not intersect not intersecting this line because we can adjust it only slightly and we get an entirely new line as i've 